So good morning, everybody. I think we can make a start. I see everyone's connecting to the virtual meeting room. Um, my name is Melanie Carr. I'm Head of Stakeholders and Communication here at EMA. And I have the pleasure of opening today's meeting and welcoming you all to this dedicated webinar on the review of the pharma legislation. So we're here today because something big is happening in the European Medicines Regulatory Network, something that doesn't happen very often, um, referred to by some as a generational change, but however which way you look at it, it's something which promises to be really quite monumental. Of course, I'm referring to the pharma package, which landed on the 26th of April, thanks to a lot of very hard work and determination at commission level, working over the past two years with the support of those across the medicines network, but also all of our stakeholders. And we at EMA believe that the new legislation presents a unique opportunity to reshape medicines regulation for better public health in the European Union. I'm therefore very excited to introduce today's webinar, which will provide an opportunity to hear firsthand from our colleagues within the European Commission about what is in the recently released legislative pack package and provide an opportunity to discuss some of the proposed revisions and raise any questions that you may have. So I'd like to introduce Olga Solomon and Florian Schmidt and thank them both for taking time out of their busy schedules to join us today. Olga Solomon is Acting Director of the Directorate G on Medical Products and Innovation within the Directorate General for Health and Food Safety, DG Sante and Head of Unit D1 on Medicines Policy, Authorization and Monitoring within DG Sante. And Florian Schmidt is the Deputy Head of the same Unit D1 within DG Sante. Olga and Florian have kindly agreed to walk us through some of the proposals and provide their insights into the thinking behind them, including the elements relating to access, availability and affordability, what we're already referring to as the triple A, as well as some of the proposed changes that touch on EMA, including patient, healthcare professional engagement, future proofing of the system, patient information and digitalization, the environment, and the all important AMR. We're joined in the virtual meeting room by representatives of patients, consumers, and healthcare professional organizations, as well as a number of academic organizations that EMA regularly li liaises with. I'd really like to thank all of you for joining me today. And I'll now pass the floor to Juan Garcia, Head of Public and Stakeholder Engagement here at EMA, who will chair today's meeting. Over to you, Juan. Thank you. Thank you very much, Melanie, and good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks for making the time to, to today's webinar. And a special thanks also from my side to Olga and to Florian, who have uh, put some time in their busy schedules at, at this time to, to introduce the, the, the proposal to um, organizations which are eligible to EMA and that regularly collaborate with us and in which, of course, the, 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 the proposal will have an impact on the way that we collaborate and continue working. So, um, as Melanie says, uh, this will be presented in two, in two blocks, and we will do that in order to facilitate the discussion and the Q&A. Um, the webinar is being recorded and will be published afterwards on our website. Uh, in terms of Q&As, what we advise is that we, as much as possible, uh, will give preference to oral questions, and we encourage everyone to use uh, the camera as much as it is possible. And, um, so we have two hours, and without any delay, I think we, we go now for the presentation, and we go to the first one uh, that, as Melanie said, will focus on the three A's, access, availability, and affordability, but also the EMA reform, including the way we engage with patients, health professionals, and stakeholders. And I will give the floor to Olga to make this part of the presentation. Thank you very much, Olga. Thank you very much, Melanie, and Juan uh, for this, you know, very nice presentation. Actually, both me and uh, Florian were extremely excited to be here together to present the uh, proposals for the revision of the legislation. Um, after uh, two years of very intense work, and two years may uh, seem quite long, but you know, in terms of you know going back into a legislation that has worked for 20 years, you know, very well, evaluating, see, you know, which are the challenges and identified, you know, the way forward. It is quite a lot of work, and in this journey, I have to. 
thank, uh, you know, because we uh, did it with a lot of efforts in the Commission, but with a lot of support and actually, you know, help from the network. And I would like to take this opportunity to help uh, the colleagues at EMA, but also in the network and the national competent authorities for uh, supporting us in this, um, in this work of identified issues that, you know, we can actually solve and, you know, create a framework which was uh, what we call future proof. So um, I'm particularly excited also to, um, you know, we are trying to explain now what, you know, we have put in place, but I am particularly excited to do this, you know, with a group of uh, patients, healthcare professionals in academia, because um, uh, one of the focuses of this uh, proposal as well, it is to better address these groups, you know, uh, in the legislation. So uh, then I can go um, in a bit more detail to give you initially the context and a bit more details about the actual proposals. So if we go to the next slide, please. Uh, yeah, so uh, I will take the first part, you know, so I will speak about access, availability and affordability and the MR reform, I think that, you know, it was already said, and then uh, uh, Florian will take the second part. So let's concentrate on the first three pillars, you know, of the reform, you know, and, uh, um, you know, if we can go to the next slide, please. Um, the next one, thank you. Very good. So uh, basically, you know, what it is the reform about? We have a legislation that it is in place, as we said, more than 20 years and overall has delivered very well in terms of uh, providing medicines that they are safe, of high quality and uh, efficacy to the European citizens. So this is kind of the principle that it is there. It has delivered our legislation and, you know, we do not touch. However, you know, we have seen since the implementation of the legislation but looking also in the wider pharmaceutical ecosystem, that there are things that, you know, they have worked uh, less well, you know, and there are challenges, you know, which are from the more technical side of things in the implementation of the legislation and how that it works, you know, in, um, you know, having in mind the future and development that they are coming, but also with issues like, you know, access of patients to the medicines that we authorize or the availability at all times of these uh, medicines. And then, you know, by extension, not directly covered by the legislation, it is also, you know, issues of uh, sustainability of the health systems and affordability of the medicines. All this is reflected, you know, in uh, the pharmaceutical strategy for Europe. This is a communication. It was kind of a reflection and policy setting document which was published by the Commission in 2020. It was kind of a roadmap of the um, uh, actually actions that, you know, we put in place to uh, address the main challenges that we have identified. This is a big strategy, you know, and one of, this on one of the 55 deliverables of the pharma strategy, it was the revision of the pharmaceutical legislation, which is, you know, a very important flagship. It is a revision that adds to actually, as I said, focus on EU citizens, but at the same time and, you know, create opportunity for patients to get the medicines they need, but, you know, as well at the same time to support industry in delivering innovation because uh, in order to be able to provide for patients, you know, we need innovation from industry. So there is a continuous focus on innovation as well. The, um, I mentioned that, you know, it is to address the long starting challenges that I explained, you know, before, including also, you know, the lessons learned that we um, had through the COVID crisis and preparing the system for future crisis, you know, as well, better than, you know, we had it up until now. At the more political and wider spectrum, this uh, revision of the legislation, it is also a big pillar of uh, the European Health Union and, and in an important milestone as well. And the European Health Union has actually three main objectives to protect, uh, uh, to better protect the health of citizens, to better equip member states, you know, with the tools to improve, to um, improve, you know, their future, our future um, actually response to pandemics and to improve the resilience of the European health systems. 
If I go more practically into how this comes, the next slide, please. You know, the um, the pharmaceutical packets, as we call it, it is um, uh, the a new regulation and a new directive. They are building, of course, into the existing pieces of legislation, the regulation and the directive. You know, with uh, I will not go to the details, but you know, the novelties, for example, in the regulation, it is that you know we have um, uh, rules, specific rules of shortages, um, specific also you know rules for the most innovative medicines as, as orphan and antimicrobials. We also um, uh, have changes with regard to the EMA governance, but also an important change as well, it is the integration of the orphan and pediatric legislation into, you know, the general pharmaceutical framework. And the new directive, it is, you know, as you know, it is the rules for placing of the medicinal product on the market, authorization and labeling and strong incentive for access. Of course, all this updated, you know, in uh, this revision. Then uh, there, there has been a council recommendation on AMR. The legal proposals, they are dealing with AMR um, and, uh, you know, both in terms of the development of new antimicrobials and prudent use, but the council recommendation is actually, you know, building more on actions that the concerns also the member states and actually that, you know, I can give you already the good news. It is such an important recommendation that it was endorsed by the member states and already um, uh, actually agreed at the Council at the EPSCO meeting uh, this week. And all these three, uh, you know, initiatives, they have a support communication. This is, you know, actually, you know, in practical terms for you, a good means to actually see what it is in this proposal. It is kind of a communication that explains the substance of the revision of the legislation and the recommendation. The next slide, please. Uh, Melanie, already mentioned, you know, the three A. So if we could have, you know, the, the six main political objectives of this proposal, we have the triple A, which is patient access, improving patient access, improving availability, as I mentioned before, in terms, you know, of uh, reducing shortages and, you know, securing a more uh, strong supply chain. And when we come to budgets of the health systems, but also individual patients, you know, to create, or if you would like, enable conditions that they can improve affordability. Then, you know, we have changes that concern um, the simplification and uh, streamlining of the regulatory framework and also make it more agile for future changes, uh, you know, uh, depending on science and technology. And be an important part as well, it is to address environmental aspects, which are currently addressed, but, you know, to uh, make them stronger and uh, you know more in line with the commitments of the commission and the member states with the green deal and also you know the combating amr so uh, if um, you know this is a legislation i mean in legal terms that you know from the beginning it was about um, it was about protecting uh, public health but also you know about creating you know a single market of pharmaceuticals in the eu but from the moment that you know, patients do not have access in medicines which we authorize to be available in all EU. We don't have a single market. So we hope that we will improve what we call the single market for medicines in the EU. The next slide, please. I will go more into the three first pillars. So when it comes to access, starting from the problem, the situation that, you know, we see today, it is a big divergence, you know, in availability or you know presence of medicines being available for patients in the different member states. So, you know, while our authorizations, they are to make medicines available in non-27 member states, which is a big advantage, you know, for companies that they apply for marketing authorization in the EU. Still, you know, we see a big discrepancy, you know, uh, both in time and in numbers, you know, of how these medicines are available to patients. So, you know, with uh, Germany, for example, you know, having up to 104 um, medicines available, you know, um, you know, while, you know, on the other um, side, you know, the other end, you know, Latvia having 11, but also, you know, with the time that, you know, the new medicines come, become available to um, patients. So, you know, in some member states, more advanced, you know, reaching the patients within, 
you know, a year or even less, you know, from their marketing authorization, while in some other countries it may take, you know, four or five years. And, you know, in actually, you know, in the right end of this diagram, uh, patients may not see medicines reaching them at all. So, um, what do we uh, propose in doing that, uh, you know, to improve the system? You know, we have to recognize that the regulation itself um, is not if we will go to the next slide, please. The, um, you know, on the left side, this, you know, you can see what I was telling you, you know, a bit about the big variants that, you know, we see among countries, you know, and variances that they depend sometimes also on the, G the uh, GDP, but also, you know, on the population of the country, but many other factors as well. So, um, you know, to address these issues, you know, and I will start to say that, you know, it is uh, the legislation is not like a silver bullet. You know, we cannot change the whole, um, you know, structure of the health system and how things operate, you know, alone. But it is, you know, an enabler and it is kind of a catalyzer probably, you know, for other changes to happen. So which are the instruments that, you know, we have? It is, you know, three different strands of work. One, it is what incentives do we give for innovation and access? The second one, it is, you know, the role of, gen of off path and medicines in this equation of access. And then, you know, the third one, which is more practical, it is, you know, can we do better with regard to authorization of medicines so to allow earlier access for patients? You know, if I come to the first, you know, um, if you the incentives, you know, what we have today, we, we can go to the next slide, please. You know, uh, what we have today, you can see it in the, on the left side of this slide. So we have a system that, you know, rewards innovation, you know, for a, a new innovative product, you know, with eight years of data protection and two years of market protection, meaning that for 10 years, the product is um, protected from generic competition. So generics cannot come into the market. You know, there is also one more year of regulatory protection, as we call it, you know, in case that the product is, um, you, know, you know, that a new indication, a new a significant indication, it is authorized for the same product. You know, this, it is actually, you know, a good system, you know, in terms of um, somehow protecting the innovator and rewarding the innovation and somehow setting, you know, uh, Europe in a competitive position with regard at international level. However, you know, this, um, you know, it is kind of a one size fit all uh, situation, you know, where we do not reward, you know, specifically medicine for, you know, giving some additional, um, you know, delivering on additional objectives of public health interest. So this is, you know, the change that we propose right now, that we continue to actually um, reward and uh, foster innovation with a very, uh, uh, you know, still a um, general system of incentives, but with a different structure. So that in practice will mean that instead of having a standard period of eight years, you know, for all medicines, we will start with a, a, a bit lower standard period of six years, and then companies can actually, you know, get what they have today and even more if they give more. You know, and what, you know, we are asking them to give, you know, we are asking them to actually, because right now, you know, the, it is unpredictable for member states or patients in one member state, even whether a company will go to that member state. So they may have a marketing authorization for a centrally authorized product, but they may choose to go to three, four, five member states, you know, and not to go to other ones. So we say to companies, you can get two more years if you, you uh, launch, you know, your product on the market in all 27, year, uh, 27 member states, and you ensure supply of these products for two years in order, you know, to, to, uh, to be able to get the two additional years of data protection. 
then companies can get uh, six more months in case that the product it is for unmet medical needs. We have seen through the years that you know there is, um, of course, you know, um, it is not um, a straight line in science between you know incentives or where science goes, but still you know the message there it is that you know um, you know you can have market-driven innovation, but if you know your product delivers on needs of patients, health systems, then you know you will be rewarded more and that will be you know with six months more and you know what it is a met medical need then the legislation will define you know the um, the main criteria for unmet medical need and this will be you know depending on the product but also you know uh, starting from the indication and then depending on the product what it is the value of the product you know in um uh, you know, with regard to other products and the specific indication. So um, it will be clear in the legislation which products, you know, will you know, be eligible for a certain incentive by defining the general criteria of unmet medical need. Um, I will come back a bit on this because it is interesting also for the group of people that are listening to me today about the unmet medical need. But let me continue, you know, a bit with the third um, uh, incentive, you know, building on incentive, which is compar comparative clinical trials. So companies, you know, will be rewarded with six more months, you know, if they have comparative clinical trials. And why? Because the comparative trials, um, I mean, they will be rewarded because it is kind of an investment in in actually, you know, making, you know, this um, bit more expensive clinical trials, but there is also a benefit for the next um, the downstream decision makers, especially HDA bodies and uh, pricing and reimbursement authorities, that they will have, you know, more evidence with regard to comparison with other products. And therefore, you know, there, you know, we can uh, come up, you know, if uh, you see to uh, nine years of uh, data protection, which is already higher than what we have today, if companies deliver or all three conditions. And then the two years of market protection, it is exactly what we have today. So, you know, in addition to years market protection and plus one year for the additional indication. So it is kind of a modulation of incentives, you know, where actually companies can come up to 12 years of protection if they deliver more. So, you know, in this sense, you know, we still retain in Europe a very competitive system to reward innovation. But at the same time, you know, with certain conditions so that we deliver also in some public health objectives. If we go um, to the next the, uh, slide, please, this gives, you know, the similar, you know, modulation of the incentives in the area of uh, medicines for rare diseases. There, you know, we have to be, you know, very careful because, you know, the uh, rare diseases, it is, uh, you know, we recognize that it is uh, still an area of high unmet medical needs. You know, I mean, all rare diseases, you know, are unmet medical needs. But what we saw also from the evaluation, it is that, uh, you know, there are a lot, six more than uh, 6,000 diseases for which we have no medicine available. And of course, you know, this is not only the, uh, you know, the willingness of industry, you know, to um, uh, invest, you know, in these diseases. It is also, you know, the difficulties of the science around and the knowledge of these diseases. So, uh, you know, the graduality, you know, of the system, you know, it is, um, you know, quite generous still, you know, with regard to the development of medicines for rare diseases. And it gives, you know, some even more focus, you know, on areas of high unmet medical needs where we do not have medicines at this moment. So the modulation it is nine um, years of uh, um, uh, market exclusivity instead of 10 years that you know we have today with one extra year for those medicinal products that they are for high and met medical needs and um, uh, the two years you know for uh, actually new indications so the two years for new indication you know they actually uh, it is a change from what you know we have today in the sense that you know they um, give an incentive for companies to develop new indications 
medications, you know, for um, existing medicines, you know, for uh, new rare conditions, you know, because these two years they will protect the whole molecule. So financially it is quite important, you know, for companies. But at the same time, you know, with this, we're trying to also and restrict some, uh, if you would like, uh, misuses of the previous system where we could see evergreening with the consequent years of data protection, of, uh, sorry, market uh, protection for new indications. So we want to keep the innovation, but at the same time, uh, uh, somehow restrict the misuse of the incentives. So a very generous and, you know, very, um, you know, important, uh, you know, system system of market, of market protection for uh, orphan medicines. You know, what I wanted to say before we go to the next point of availability, it is that, you know, for our mathematical needs, I mentioned that, you know, we uh, set much more important criteria in the legislation that we have now with regard to how we define a mathematical need. This is, you know, will not be exhaustive. We'll not try to actually, you know, go to the details. We are putting the general framework. So if you would like to give a line to companies, you know, start already now to think of the future, what to invest. But at the same time, you know, there are scientific elements, more scientific elements of implementation of this criteria that we will ask um, uh, EMA together, you know, with the member states to actually develop more in the terms of scientific guidelines with regard, for example, you know, how do you interpret, you know, notions like uh, remaining morbidity or mortality and uh, issues like that, you know, in the implementation of the areas of unmet medical need. We know that you know, how you define a mathematical need, it is very close to the hearts of you know, patients, healthcare professionals, as well as industry, but also, you know, HD bodies and um, uh, pricing and reimbursement authorities, because the understanding what we are trying to actually, you know, close here, it is the gap in the understanding of what it is a mathematical need, where we give incentives, etc. you know, what evidence we are looking, you know, for these products, etc. So what we foresee is that, you know, when the agency will develop these guidelines, there will be a consultation mechanism where all these bodies, including, you know, yourself, healthcare professional, patients, uh, and, um, uh, you know, academia, you know, will be consulted in this interpretation of the unmet medical needs criteria. So um, I think with this, I can go to the next, you know, if you would like priority of this proposal, uh, which is uh, the uh, issue of shortages and availability of uh, medicines. So um, I think that um, more than anyone else, it is the patients and the healthcare professionals that uh, they actually um, are impacted by the huge challenge that you know we have today with the shortages of medicines. So um, uh, you know and. You know, not, uh, you know, going to detail how important this problem is, you know, and how it affects your lives every day. But um, uh, I will mention that, you know, as you know as well, that the causes for shortages, it is um, uh, multifactorial in, and uh, there is a lot of attention in this revision uh, to address these issues, the current challenges about um, uh, the shortages and the supply chain. So, um, specifically you know what we are proposed actually it is a mechanism within the legislation to improve the situation with uh, obligations for example for marketing authorization holders you know to uh, be uh, strengthened uh, and uh, this say uh, it is to impose for example early and harmonized reporting of shortages and withdrawals of medicines and maintenance of shortage prevention plans and uh, this is actually you know um, a request not so much for formalistic or uh, reasons but in terms to allow for the authorities to be able you know to uh, coordinate you know and take action earlier so to avoid you know difficult situation in the end it, it continues also the uh, introduces requirements for continuous monitoring of shortages by competent authorities at national level at the European medicines agencies as well uh, to allow for uh, the swift identification and the management uh, of the critical uh, shortages at EU level. 
The EMA also will be empowered with a strength and coordination role to monitor and manage those critical shortages of medicines at EU level at all times. Together with the executive steering group on shortages and safety of medicinal products, you know, you know the MSSG. For critical shortages, marketing authorization holder of those medicines will have to work to resolve this, those shortages, taking into account MSSG recommendation and reporting the results of measures taken. An example of such recommendation to companies from the MSSG could be to reorganize manufacturing capacity or to adjust the distribution to improve supply. And then member states will also need to give feedback to EMA and then, you know, in general, more transparency on shortages will be achieved through the publication of information of uh, shortages. Another very important measure to which, you know, work has already started, it is the creation of, um, you know, what we call the uh, list of critical medicines at the, uh, at the EU level. And um, mm -hmm. uh, this is also to help identify the uh, vulnerabilities in the supply uh, chain, you know, for um, medicinal products. So, um, you know, this is kind of, um, you know, measures that they build up on what it has started already, you know, with the EMA extended mandate for the pandemic and uh, colleagues at EMA together, you know, with the national competent authorities are working already in building this, com this uh, system, you know, with the European Commission as well. So, you know, this is work that builds on something that has started, but, you know, we need to go further because, um, you know, as I said before, the issue is very, you know, important, but we also need to see it in, you know, the context of other actions as well under, you know, HERA, uh, joint action on shortages, you know, funding mechanisms, etc. So, um, if I go to uh, being aware of the time, you know, if I go to the last pillar, which is the affordability, you know, the uh, this proposal is not uh, going to actually intervene within. Uh, areas of national competence, which is like the pricing and the reimbursement of medicines. Uh, it is uh, what we are trying to do, it is to create actually an enabling environment where the measures that, you know, we put in this regulation can help, you know, the decisions makers, you know, after authorization and uh, also, you know, that they can um, somehow um, help, you know, with the, um, with the earlier entry of generics. So more specifically, you know, for the earlier entry of generics, you know, we provide proposed measures, you know, both in terms of, you know, simplifications, you know, so um, with the authorization, with uh, uh, simplification and streamlining of procedures, both for generic uh, and biosimilar medicines, especially for biosimilars with the experience of the um, last years, you know, where uh, and the uh, experience of the agency with the authorization of these uh, medicines. And um, also, you know, the earlier energy of generics will come, you know, if uh, the originators that do not manage to deliver on the uh, other objectives, so basically, you know, their protection periods will be reduced and the next can come into the market area. You know, also we have some transparency provisions about, you know, companies that they can, they, they got public funding about their research and development so that this information can be available also to to the healthcare technology, you know, and uh, health technology assessment and pricing and reimbursement bodies. The comparative trials, which I explained before, it is another step, you know, actually to give more information to the downstream decision makers. And uh, also, you know, um, the uh, legal text provides a lot of possibilities for exchanges from parallel scientific advice in uh, scientific, for example, guidelines about unmet medical needs, but also, you know, and um, in a in more wide consultation and cooperation between regulator, regulators, pricing and reimbursement bodies, you know, so that, you know, we close the gap between the uh, different decision makers. So um, this, um, the next point, it is the uh, competitive regulatory framework, you know, so the next slide. Um, 
No, you know, which is actually, you know, by the uh, simplification of the EMA structure. This is an important, uh, you know, change, which I would like to explain to you. You know, um, the European Medicines Agency, you know, and the uh, network of the national COVID authorities, they have operated, you know, the uh, for the last, you know, 20 years in, you know, an impeccable way in terms of delivering in safety, uh, security and quality, you know, of medicines. And also, you know, um, we saw during COVID that even under these, you know, conditions, you know, the European system could deliver. On the other hand, you know, we also saw during COVID, but also beyond COVID, that the limits of, you know, the both the EMA in terms of resources and capacity, but also the national competent authorities, they have been stretched. And also, you know, we see new developments happening, you know, with new areas of, uh, you know, um, science and development, but also technologies, you know, artificial intelligence is coming, new types of products, you know, and what we had up until now, it is a system which is built on the previous experience, you know, so we had advanced therapy medicinal products, you know, we have created, you know, a specific committee, the same for orphan, the same for pediatric medicines. So it was a time, you know, with the revision of this legislation to take stock and, you know, see how we can use actually, you know, the uh, positive experience, you know, of our a system which is kind of a paradigm for the whole world, but, you know, somehow, you know, make it more efficient. So keeping the strength, which is the expertise and, you know, the collaboration at central and national level, but at the same time, make it more efficient. So this is, you know, um, in a nutshell, you can see, you know, how we move from the current system, you know, with the seven committees into a system, you know, which is, you know, much simpler. Uh, but as I said, by keeping, you know, the expertise. So um, what, you know, we propose, it is that uh, we maintain two uh, committees. Uh, the CHMP and uh, the, uh, the PRAC, so, you know, for the authorization of medicines and the, for monitoring of medicines. But, however, that we um, increase the competencies, you know, of uh, these uh, committees to include the expertise that, you know, now it was scattered in the other committees. And also, you know, these committees will not operate alone but uh, the, uh, they will be, you know, supported in this case by working parties which will keep the expertise that comes, you know, from the member states but also beyond member states. So, and um, there will be also an expert pool, you know, a pool of experts with different expertise and we actually, you know, we uh, are confident that uh, this pooling of expertise together will give more agility, you know, and more um, to the system to be able to deal, you know, with new um, scientific developments, new, with new products and expertise. So speaking about capacity and expertise, we are also, you know, um, looking into the training opportunities for experts so that, you know, we keep this expertise uh, in the system, you know, always up to date. I think um, an important element that, um, you know, I need to, to mention it is that the uh, representation, both of the member states in the committees, you know, and of the patients and uh, healthcare professional organizations, it is extremely important to us in this uh, new structure. So, um, just to say that the representation of the member states in the main committees will not change. So, basically, all member states will be represented at this um, committee committees which somehow, you know, they are the opinion makers, you know, with the expertise that they get from the working parties and uh, advisory groups. But also, you know, we will have a patient representation not and um, a healthcare professional representation, not only with the working parties that you can see, uh, you know, uh, in this structure very clearly, but also with their specific representation within the committees. And, you know, it is the first time that, you know, you will see that, you know, we have, we propose a very important representation of both patients and healthcare professionals in the main committee, the CHNP. Also, um, um, 
the other element that I would like to um, mention, because it is also, you know, very important, it is that the representation and the expertise of the CHMP uh, will also integrate in areas, you know, of different products and different therapeutic areas, you know, and uh, for example, you know, for orphan diseases, for pediatric medicines, for ATMPs, but, you know, also, you know, with what will be, you know, new developments. So I think with this, because I took a bit too much time, uh, you know, in my presentation, and apologies for that, I will, um, uh, you know, uh, one last thing, because it is not only the structure, the other issue that we propose, which is very important, it is the timelines. So you will see that we propose a bit more efficiency in the timelines through uh, reduction of the assessment time, but also the approval time, which will reduce the time of general, uh, at least for the legal deadlines, from 277 days to 226 uh, days in order to um, somehow increase the competitiveness of uh, our system. So um, with this, I would like to really thank you for your patience and I'm very keen to listen to your uh, questions. Thank you. On the contrary, Olga, thank you very much. I think for being so comprehensive and so clear. And uh, yeah, I think we can now break for questions on these topics that you have covered. And um, <clears throat> we already have um, Francois, and I, we will ask you to introduce and your organization so that Olga and Florian knows who is uh, making the questions. Uh, please, Francois. So about the prime program, the priority medicines, uh, which is an extremely important program with a sense of priority for some medicines, but it stops at the marketing authorization. There, there are no provisions, no measures uh, for what follows in HTA or EU procurement or facilitating access to these products in, in Europe. And, and that's maybe a part which is missing in the legislative proposal. And also for compassionate use programs, there is a proposal to have a European register, but that's it. And we know the difficulties uh, to access compassionate use, even for emergency preparedness, with the ETF able to propose recommendations for use, but not even half of member states can operate a compassionate use program in less than six months. So there, there, there is a need here to better organize the, the regulatory system for compassionate use. And maybe just to, just a, a third point regarding the the structure of the of the EMA. We understand that it will introduce more flexibility and less rigidity among the different committees that have to be consulted for for in the current pre, uh, situation. But then it puts all the decisions on the CHMP and they meet uh, three four days a, a month. Is that realistic to expect that they can spend as much time as needed on, on all dossiers, uh, having to make many more decisions that uh, they, that they used to, to make in, in the past? Thank you. Thank you, Francois. Olga? Yeah, no, thank you very much, Francois. I mean, with regard to the prime, and um, you know, there are a lot of issues that I didn't have the time to explain. You know, and thank you for the question about the prime because the prime it is a good experience in actually giving. <clears throat> pre-authorization support from the agency on products that they are they have the potential you know to uh, their, their breakthrough and they have the potential to address <coughs> i'm sorry unmet medical needs now you know i see your point about you know the next um state decision makers you know how the hta bodies and pricing and reimbursement <coughs> of course with this proposal we cannot engage, you know, um, or uh, somehow commit the next parties. But of course, you know, you know, it, there are a lot of discussions, you know, nowadays about how do we streamline more, you know, as an ecosystem, our efforts to products for unmet medical needs. <coughs> Sorry, you know, I um, have a call, you know. So uh, how do we streamline our, um, you know, our process you know we see you know the belgian you know paper that it is in the council right now to sp speaking about you know the willingness to pay about you know the unmet medical need more um, need driven innovation etc 
So I would say the prime and the discussions around a mathematical need where uh, the HD bodies, pricing and reimbursement bodies will be, you know, involved in the sense of defining this, it comes a bit, you know, to close the gap. Again, you know, I must not give the impression that the prime product, you know, will go through with, you know, no you know, uh, requirements or criti critical examination from HTA bodies and pricing and reimbursement. But what I say, it is what we try with a general, you know, approach in the legislation. It is to close the gap, create more collaboration and more, and uh, actually, especially, you know, for products for unmet medical needs, which prime are, uh, you know, there. So, this is the best we can do. For compassionate, you know, use, you know, you are clear, you know, we have, um, uh, we will increase the transparency, you know, asking more information about compassionate use. <laughs> but compassionate use uh, remains a national competence. So, you know, uh, we will um, have, <laughs> we started already, you know, and probably, you know, you know, some reflection on how to use better the compassionate use in the EU. The HMA has worked on this. Again, you know, we do the most, you know, we can within the legal framework, but it can be work done, you know, outside the legal framework to use this instrument. And, you know, now with the information coming to EMA, I think that it is an opportunity, you know, for more transparency to uh, somehow, uh, you know, work together on uh, compassionate use for the, because it can, it is a route that it is very interesting for uh, uh, serving patients before authorization. <coughs> I don't know, if Florian, you want to add something on compassionate use? Um, I mean, just to say that uh, I, I think with what we are proposing, we are not uh, really f fundamentally changing the, the, the system, but closing the gaps. Um, and uh, we, we know that compassionate use is already widely used in, in, in member states, but what we saw as a problem also from the learnings from the COVID experience that you mentioned is that information is not uh, fully exchanged uh, about um, the experience then also about compassionate use programs and there this uh, information is obviously an important source uh, about the early use of the products both for regulators but also for the users and that is something which we uh, as Olga said uh, want to to enable more obviously recognizing that compassionate use is not something which stays there forever. It is a bridge between um, um, research and development efforts and then the ultimate authorization. And it is still placed in that um, bridging um, situation, but uh, with a more structured sense. And then in a way, this information could then uh, uh, also, as we have seen in the past, better be used in the crisis situation if it comes more structured into the system by, uh, if we are in a crisis situation by ETF, but if we are in a non-crisis situation even by the CHMP when forming the final scientific opinion on, on the product. And that is also very important for us to take this early or to enable the regulator, the scientific committees to take this early experience into account when shaping the uh, SMPC. Mm. So there are still opportunities. And then on your last point, uh, Francois, on the decisions, you know, of course, you know, the in, in order to be able to deliver, you know, in this structure, you know, we have to make other more uh, practical, you know, arrangements about, you know, um, how, you know, the, the uh, working parties will work in relation to the committees so that they facilitate the work of the committees. Also, you know, as you said, you know, the three, four days per month, you know, is it only, you know, monthly, maybe things that the CHMP can, uh, can have. No, all these systems will need to adapt to the, you know, the processes. I mean, you know, we need to adapt, you know, to uh, these new changes and we will be working with colleagues at EMA and the national competent authorities to uh, uh, build on this structure. So to be able, you know, to implement it, you know, it is a work that it will take, you know, years, you know, to be able, you know, to achieve this. And it is not, you know, with the current structure, we just change, you know, the committees and all is done. We're very much aware of that, you know. Um, yeah, thank you. I thank think you, yeah. it's, it's, it's all well addressed. Uh, I give the floor to Piotr Szymanski from the European Society of Cardiology. Thank you very much for an excellent presentation. I would like to ask about the exclusivity period. 
extending it is an excellent idea for orphan drugs. However, I would like to ask you whether you have analyzed an impact of shortening exclusivity period on possible conduct of phase three and phase four clinical trials that uh, for the compounds, for the drugs that require particularly long-term follow-up in order to achieve significant results. This is certain chronic diseases with relatively low mortality, such as stable coronary artery disease, because uh, we may consider it a, a bit a risk of the incentivizing industry and a lack of incentive to provide long-term follow-ups and conduct phase for trials for the for the diseases and conditions that require uh, study periods that extend five years in order to achieve reasonable results in terms of mortality and morbidity so uh, has any have uh, any analysis been done on that, so not on orphan drugs, but on drugs that address unmet medical needs in large populations with uh, stable and low mortality, low morbidity, civilization diseases. So this is the first question. And the second question and declaration at the same time is that ESC, of course, declares participating in any expert bodies. Uh, related to the development of the definition of unmet medical needs. And then again, a comment here is that, at least to, to, to our understanding at, at the moment, the definition of unmet medical need and surrogate endpoints and trial protocol, protocols are oriented towards more innovative drugs and orphan indications, mainly in very small populations. Uh, so, it would be very important to consider also in the definition of unmet medical needs, large populations with relatively stable diseases and relatively, uh, let's say, mild uh, clinical picture requiring long term to prove the efficacy of drugs. So that's another point. And the third one and the last one, uh, it seems that as previously participation of experts is envisaged in their own capacity is there a place for learned societies for scientific societies such as esc to participate formally in in the committees well it is not the case now thank you very much Juan, shall I take directly the floor? Yes, Olga. Yeah, thank you. No, uh, thank you. Very relevant questions, of course, you know, and, uh, um, you know, for your first question about, you know, the um, exclusivity, the exclusivity period, it is um, to reward, if you would like, investment in research, you know, and costs that they have put in research in prior to marketing authorization. We must also, you know, I must also mention there that, you know, the protection does not come only from the regulatory protection. You know, we have a very strong patent system, you know, in Europe that, uh, that somehow protects the innovation you know, in general. Um, the, um, you know, what you were saying, you know, about the impact, you know, it is very important. We have made an impact, you know, assessment of what that would be for, you know, all actors, also from the social, you know, and, you know, the economic perspective, etc. cetera. Uh, indeed, you know, we haven't done, you know, an impact assessment on the clinical trials that they would be performed later on because, you know, we do not see, you know, the... Uh, uh, if you would like the uh, obligation of marketing authorization uh, um, uh, holders to follow their products after authorization as part of a reward or not. You know, for us, you know, I mean, it is the system now, I suppose, you know, we may have eight years of data protection, you know, instead of six today, but, you know, you may have clinical trials that go beyond. So what I want to say here it is that, you know, the uh, following up, you know, with clinical trials post-authorization, long-term follow-up, etc., it will be kind of an obligation. You know, we continue, we will continue to have post-authorization marketing obligation to, 
to when necessary to complete you know the data or to follow up the patients and i would say except from the legal obligations which is one of the tools that you know we have based on the science you know that you provide and you know the recommendations of the chfb you know for me i see it also as a corporate responsibility of the company to actually you know have this follow-up without necessarily always have a, a you know a financial reward for this uh, at the same time you know i mean i need to say again you know together with the patent system and you know the six standard year of mark of data protection plus the additional periods we are still a very competitive uh, ju jurisdiction or environment, if you would like, compared to the global level. So, um, I mean, in, just to conclude that, you know, we have means in the legislation to be able for patients and for care, for care professionals, but also for the soundness of our decision making, to request for such, such a studies when we need them, independent of the exclusivity period. Um, with regard to um, the participation about, you know, the unmet medical need, you know, you are right in saying that, that, you know, the focus of the unmet medical need and the definition it is uh, with uh, innovative medicines in terms of linking the unmet medical need with the incentive. At the same time, you know, the innovation that, you know, you spoke about, it is um, uh, is uh, you know it, it's not like we do not want to downgrade the importance of innovation which is um, you know either from existing medicines for example you know or for a different groups you know so it's not that you know um, you know the standard period of six years first of all as I said it is to reward you know other types of innovation this is just you know an extra push for unmet medical needs and then you know just that take the opportunity to say that you know it is a novelty of this proposal that for example to recognize innovation that comes with data from academia for NGOs you know from other sources than the marketing authorization holder we can actually you know support repurposing of existing medicines we can put it on label and I think this is a very important and also rewarded because you know we have four years I think this is a major development you know in uh, you know in uh, this uh, revision and then for the learned societies there I'm afraid my um, reply will be you know um, you know rather negative because uh, the appointment in the committees will continue to be on you know, personal basis, you know, and the basis of expertise, but we'll have a quite range of expertise, you know, that uh, that's why, you know, we have um, four um, uh, members from the patient's community and four members, you know, from the healthcare professional's community, which is an important representation in the main committee, you know, with alternates, uh, you know, for, uh, for each one. Thank you. Thank you, Olga. Um, I give the floor now to Adriana Cecchi. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. I have uh, one question about uh, one of the first slides presented by Olga, where she divides the two instrument regulator, regulation and directive according to the fact that the regulation is mainly aimed to support innovation while the directive is for plusing on the market. My problem is that in the regulation, uh, the explanation uh, re regarding uh, the value of promoting innovation is only focused on orphan and antimicrobial. While I don't I didn't see the word pediatric medicine. So I would like to understand better why pediatric that are in a very strong need to be covered by innovative drug are not mentioned there. And this is uh, questionable also because in the regulation, many parts have been excluded and moved to the directive. And uh, 
Frankly, I am not sure that the impact of this modification has been sufficiently addressed. I didn't find anything in the impact assessment uh, public. I, I am studying still. I'm not sure to have understood all, no, absolutely. But this is a point that is very stressing to me. Why we moved this consistent part to the directive and which would be realistically the effect of this modification? And why into the regulation, the only part that is clearly non-innovation, non-innovative, that is the pediatric use marketing authorization, has been maintained while all the other aspects seem to be preclusive to the pediatrics field. This is one point. And the second, very shortly, is that when you describe the access to medicine, in my mind, the, uh, the picture is not indicative because it is uh, presented by member states, but is not presented by age. And we know very well that the waiting time for pediatric medicine is longer and most about seven years from the waiting time for an adult product. So, the second question is, how do you think that the current proposal may ameliorate the access to pediatric medicine? Because to you have shown us how this may happen for orphan, but again, again pediatric are completely uh, not considered. Thank you. Thank, thank you me. very yeah sorry <laughs> um no thank you Andriana. i think that you know i think if i should start by apologizing for not putting you know more on pediatric this was kind of um, you know a necessity because of the little time i had because um, you know pediatric medicines they are actually you know in the heart of this revision we should actually mention it more and shouldn't be lost starting from your um first question about um, you know i mean i would like to explain probably i was not very clear you know the regulation is not about innovation the directive is not about innovation the two instruments they work together and i have a florian who is a lawyer to explain more actually you know the you know also how they interact from the legal perspective because you asked a specific question but you know for us the regulation and the directive you know they are interwebs you know they are working together you know, there are different things for uh, that they are set for, um, you know, some legal issues in the different instruments. But for example, the directive, it is the instrument not for placing, it is actually for, uh, first and foremost, setting the requirements and the standards for the authorization of all medicines. And, you know, in particular, of course, the innovative medicines. So it's not kind of, you know, two classes, you know, of instruments that are working together, you know, towards the same, actually, objectives. Um, it is not in my slide that I mentioned that the pediatrics, you know, they are, um, you know, they are included like the orphans, you know, within the current instruments, you know, and you are right for pediatrics who have both provisions in the regulation and in the directive. Uh, you know, maybe, you know, Florian, you want to take the floor on the um, the move to the directive or certain yeah. provisions and the effect? I mean, in a, in a way, this is a result of, of legal technicalities uh, and it, it shouldn't be understood as either downgrading or upgrading certain provisions. Uh, you know, we, currently we, we have a self-standing legal uh, instrument and um, what we are proposing now to integrate the provisions that are currently in the pediatric regulation in these two instruments. And what guided us 
when deciding where to put the provisions uh, either in the directive or in the, in the regulation was basically the thinking that we put in the regulation um, all the provisions that relate to the agreement of the pediatric investigation plan as this is done by, by the European Medicines Agency. While in the directive, we put um, basically the general requirements that for every a medicine or product, a company has to um, consider the pediatric use and um, has to do this before they apply uh, for a marketing authorization, independent whether this is a national marketing authorization or uh, a central marketing authorization. So the place of uh, this legal provision is not changing the, the legal force or the, the, the legal quality of, 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 the, of the current requirement. It is just a legal technicality that we know that uh, the, the pediatric provisions are also of relevance for national authorized products. Therefore, we didn't uh, want to put it in a legal instrument that is mainly as the regulation does, dealing with um, uh, uh, centrally authorized products. And as regards, uh, I mean, the functioning of the pediatric system, I think what we, what we propose is a natural progression of, of the current system. So we, we, we keep many of the good functioning pillars of the current pediatric system in place, but we also introduce some learnings uh, uh, from the current system. And I, I, uh, I, one of the learnings you, you mentioned is that it always takes a lot of time uh, or we, we observe that it takes a lot of time until the pediatric studies are uh, finalized, even after the initial marketing authorization. And therefore, we, we um, limit the time companies have um, to complete the pediatric studies, the so-called deferrals. You are familiar with the, um, uh, with the details of, of the system. Um, and in time, so that we, so to say, pressure or push, pressure, uh, put pressure on companies to um, uh, complete pediatric studies earlier and thereby also give um, the ensure early access of these products uh, to uh, pediatric patients. We also introduced the uh, so-called mechanism of action principle so that uh, we, we um, allow this uh, to close this deficiency currently if the um, product is not uh, is covering an adult disease which is not um, appearing in uh, in children then companies have to do nothing under the new proposal if the mechanism of action is also useful for children diseases that are different from other diseases companies still have uh, to invest uh, in the uh, in pediatric research and the final thing i want to mention is that uh, we also uh, introduced a kind of stepwise pediatric investigation plan. So to avoid that sometimes time is lost with, uh, with an intensive discussion about the pediatric investigation plan early in the product development, um, where there are some also theoretical assumptions. Now companies can also come um, with a stepwise approach, building on first results of the pediatric research, and then again a discussion with the agency to mature uh, better to also take into account learnings from um, the, the current system. Yeah, just to complement, you know, and then on your question about access, you are right that you know, and and uh, it, it was not on the slide, but you know, you are absolutely right. What we see actually as delays you know, for, um, you know, the adult medicine, they're even more accentuated for pediatric medicine. So, you know, our approach it is, you know, in two different ways. One, it is if we actually uh, give earlier access to the um, adult medicine, so this will affect also, you know, the, um, uh, together with the measures that Florian said, so the combination of the two will improve access for, uh, for children as well. This is, you know, the logic a bit of the intervention and um, the impact assessment you know um, uh, just to say that you know on pediatric medicines as for orphans there has been a separate evaluation and a separate impact assessment so uh, 
you will see, you know, in our impact assessment that there is the, the, the pediatric medicines are specifically, you know, addressed. So um, it is a huge work, but I'm sure that, you know, with the time you will discover that, you know, there has been uh, an impact assessment specifically on pediatric medicines. Yes, Olga, just to clarify, I, I say that the fact that some requirement are removed in the directive ah. is not uh, okay <laughs> not, i'm not discussing about the yeah. and uh, just a, a limited point i remain skeptic about uh, mm -hmm. the fact that in several national market the situation may be improved and uh, i have a question I think that we need to have a dedicated seminar like this, dedicated only to the pediatric medicine issue. If this is possible, it may be very informative for everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Adriana. Thank you also for the explanation, Olga and Florian. We are going to take one more question before we go to the second part. Uh, Claudia, uh, but please be very brief, otherwise we are running out of time. Yes, uh, thank you very much. I'll be brief. Um, so uh, I'll just, I would like some clarifications regarding the participation, how you'll organize the participation of patients in the various working groups uh, of the CHMP. Um, and uh, if there is any consideration, you know, of uh, in, uh, ensuring patient participation in the CMDH uh, at some point, for example. Thank you. Thank you. Olga, Florian. Yeah, in, um, you know, with regard to the participation and the working parties, you know, the legislation is very, you know, it specifies, you know, the participation and how it happens in the main committees. In the working parties, you know, uh, the working parties, there will be experts according to the area and the, their expertise. So it does not precisely, uh, you know, refer to, uh, you know, the patients, but there is the possibility for representation according to the expertise. Thank you. To clarify that, and uh, in a way, that's something which in a way is already in, in practice at the moment. Okay, so I think we can we can try to move to the um, to the next part of the presentation, and we give the floor to Florian. So, in, in, a, in a way, uh, yeah, I will complement uh, what has already been uh, said with uh, with a few further topics. Um, uh, we called it future proving patient information and digitalization, environmental issues, and the whole um, uh, issues around what can we do with this legislation um, to uh, um, pro uh, tackle the antimicrobial resistance issue. If I start with the, um, the next, uh, the first topic, um, a streamlined future-proof regulatory framework. What I think is uh, important for us in this regard is to take stock of the learnings from the past. Um, and we are dealing with a legislation that is 20 years old. So it is legislation which um, is based on, on concepts that were um, visible at the time. Um, and a lot has happened in medicines development, uh, both how uh, companies approach um, the, the R&D phase, but also how regulators then deal with the applications. And that is currently not fully reflected in the, in the um, legislation and um, needs to be better enabled. So we are not completely changing our pillars of the system, quality, safety, efficacy in the assessment, but um, we want to um, take into account of, of the experience and enable um, certain concepts better, both in the pre-authorization phase the post-authorization phase and obviously um, also during uh, the authorization itself um, with, with new ideas and new concepts in legislation. And I want in the next slide to um, um, basically um, mention uh, a few things. There will be um, facilities, uh, facilitation for uh, the European Medicines Agency, but also for national uh, um, medicines regulators to uh, have a simpler way of dealing 
with uh, applications. So they can, for example, uh, reject at an early stage immature applications to also avoid this frustration we currently have in the system that uh, sometimes there are long stop clocks uh, where companies are asked for additional information um, to, to complement the HTML data to make the system more efficient. As a learning from uh, the COVID situation, we will have the possibility for the agency to review data in phases. I mean, you may uh, remember this name rolling review um, that we had in uh, in COVID for, for some of the therapeutics for the vaccines. We will also enable this um, during uh, uh, standard uh, times, not only during the pandemic. Uh, electronic submissions become the standard. And we, um, we, we, uh, we clarify the interplay between um, this legislation, but also the uh, medical devices legislation, substances of uh, human origin legislation, because in a way, what is one of the key learnings from the past is um, that um, modern medicines are more complex. They are not just a, a medicinal product, a medicine a pill as such. They are um, linked to uh, diagnostics, they are linked to medical devices, they touch base with, with, with other regulatory environments and that need to be better uh, taken care of also in the legislation to facilitate um, the, um, the authorization itself, but also to enable the, the full use then um, in the next step by uh, the, the doctors, by the patients, and therefore we improve the provisions um, there, I mean, we, we already talked a bit about uh, real-world evidence in the in the previous uh, discussion about obligations of companies um, to to submit also data after the the authorization. And there we have looked critically at the list of obligations of empowerments regulators have to, to put on companies and um, basically increase the toolbox of, of obligations um, that, uh, if useful, if necessary, can um, uh, be uh, required from companies. And I would like to mention here one example. Um, we now enable better to um, require studies regarding dosing improvements um, of um, products. Um, which currently are more voluntarily done um, by, by companies, but they can all also be imposed um, uh, on uh, companies. And then, as Olga explained, uh, we will also have this possibility that uh, academia, nonprofit entities can um, provide regulators with data from uh, their own uh, use of the product. Uh, they can uh, provide uh, studies they have commissioned, and then there is a process within the legislation which allows uh, um, the regulators to take this data package that is not coming from the company, but from third parties into account, uh, analyze it, and uh, then uh, take also regulatory measures that ultimately could then also lead to the fact that uh, this information, uh, which is known from the users, can be, become part of the authorized uh, product itself. What I also would like to mention is um, that we will facilitate with this um, legislation, which is more uh, from the user perspective, uh, important electronic product information and also multi-language packages. There are, there are different elements in this multi-language or multi-country packages are, can be important also for access um, uh, to medicines because it is um, uh, sometimes uh, easier to, to uh, bring products on the market if they are designed for several um, member states, specifically um, in, in smaller member states situation. And we would like to enable this better because it, it can be useful and it, it can also help in times of shortages where um, their um, product may still be available in one member state, why not in the other? If you have 
multi-language, multi-country package. It facilitates um, basically the redirecting products from one member state to another. The other point is electronic product information. Um, we, we see um, um, ever more the use of electronic tools. We all have our smartphones um, with, with uh, important information, with apps and they're um, enabling electronic product information, uh, enabling uh, reading, for example, barcodes on a product package that could then lead um, to um, product information becoming available for patients on an, a smartphone uh, will be um, better enabled. Still, uh, it will be uh, necessary to uh, give uh, patients always access uh, to the um, printed leaflet, at least uh, as, a, as a general rule objective to, to take into account uh, that uh, electronic digital literacy is still something which is uh, not even in the, in the European Union. So if you go to the next slide, um, I also would like to mention some um, innovative concepts we introduce uh, in the legislation to um, support um, regula regulatory learnings with regard to new um, uh, scientific, uh, new medicine or products. And here we have introduced a concept that is called regulatory sandbox. Uh, and sandbox uh, is a bit of a fancy name, but it is meaning basically a, a structured testing environment where in, 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 in a controlled uh, way uh, new innovative products can be tested um, before they are fully regulated by legislation and before um, uh, even before the, the, the authorization itself. And this is um, necessary in our view to at least enable this possibility because um, we, we see a, a lot of new technical approaches coming also to the, to the um, uh, medicines field. And it's obviously difficult for legislation uh, to, in, to really know what is coming in the, in the future. And this sandbox environment, this testing environment, will provide a possibility for a limited time uh, to get familiar with these new concepts, to test them before we put the actual rules in legislation, to then, on the basis of the learnings from this testing, also design the legislation in, in a better way. And that, I think, will both improve uh, the chance of early access to these new innovative methods and uh, the sound regulatory um, a shaping of the legislative uh, requirements. Um, we, we already spoke about uh, the uh, regulatory support to um, innovative unmet medical need medicines uh, through the prime project. So this is this really a key feature to, to better enable this pre-authorization support because um, if we bring uh, companies, regulators uh, together at an early point in time. This will, um, at least from the experience we already have uh, from the prime project of the agency, shorten development uh, timelines. Um, it will also ensure better robust data packages when the company is filing and then ultimately also reduce assessment times and um, then bring in the end the product earlier to the market. Um, what I also want to mention, we, we also critically looked again at the, the provisions with regards to animal testing in our legislation, um, where we already um, yeah, see a lot of reduction of animal testing, but we, we looked again to, to better enforce that. This is um, only a couple of, um, of the measures we, we have in this uh, sphere, but I think I wanted to highlight them um, here also in this talk. And obviously, real world evidence was mentioned. What um, what we have done when going through the existing legislation, looking at the provisions, um, can be better enable that because that will be uh, an important data source. And some of you may know. In parallel to this legislation, we are also proposing an European health data space to bring 
uh, real world evidence in a more structured way together in Europe. And then we need to make the links between this uh, legislation and uh, the health data space uh, legislation. I'm going to the next slide. Um, um, one important topic um, we, we also wanted to improve was the environmental sustainability of pharmaceuticals because there is an environmental footprint of pharmaceuticals, which you can see with residues uh, that are found in in water or in the soil uh, coming uh, from the use and disposal of uh, pharmaceuticals. And what we observe uh, as a weakness of the uh, current rules is um, that the enforcement is um, not as good as it could be. We, we already have uh, provisions in the legislation that require, uh, require companies to study the environmental risks of their active substance, of their product, and to propose measures. But um, from a legal point of view, the current provisions are uh, not um, uh, enforced in an ideal way and um, can be improved. So what we look here, uh, are looking here at was not so much introducing necessary new concepts. We still keep uh, the necessity of companies to come at the time of marketing authorization with an environmental risk assessment, but uh, improving the uh, enforcement by really push companies, you have to provide at the time of marketing authorization a sound, a complete environmental risk assessment. And ultimately, if the company would fail um, with the risk that well, we, we have to say, no, at this point in time, we cannot grant the marketing authorization, you would have to first complete the environmental risk assessment. But in a way, you would also expect with this ultimate threat in place that companies will do a better job upfront so that we may not even have to use it, but uh, we, we had to introduce it in the legislation um, to uh, um, at least uh, as, um, strengthen compliance. Um, we, we also have provisions to, because this environmental risk assessment uh, provision I mentioned, was only introduced in 2005, so we still have medicines um, uh, used where we don't have um, structured environmental information in, in the possession of regulators. So we foresee a provision that allows uh, uh, the, um, the regulators to introduce a plan for um, catching up on these old uh, products and also require submission on that data. And uh, what I also would like to mention for antimicrobials, we went one step further and also require more information about the manufacturing uh, process um, because in that specific field, we think it is important as a manufacturing can also be a source for building resistance to include this in um, this part of the assessment independent of uh, legislation that is already in place to uh, govern um, uh, the, the oversight of, of chemical uh, production sites uh, in Europe. Um, can we go to the next slide? Um, because I, I spoke about antimicrobial resistance, um, it was important for us also to use this legal instrument to improve um, the fight, the um, what we can do to tackle this um, this important problem, and I mean, you see here uh, some some figures um, um, of of this issue, which really point to um, uh, uh, yeah, a situation that needs to be better addressed, and it cannot be only addressed. Uh, through this uh, legislation, what we are doing here is complementary to a more holistic plan uh, to, uh, in the fight uh, against AMR. But at the same time, we think, uh, um, yes, there are important um, contributions that can be done uh, through this legislation. And um, you know, they are along two main topics. It's uh, first the prudent uh, and appropriate use of antimicrobials, so how we use them, and there um, the, the rules will be strengthened in the way uh, that there is a prescription by default for antimicrobials, uh, 
we um, take, um, make emphasis that um, uh, the pack size, uh, the, the quantities that are authorized should correspond to the, uh, the indication to the therapy so that we have no um, um, basically spillage coming from unused antimicrobials because there are more pills in the pack uh, than needed. The, we put emphasis uh, on uh, what we call here education and material. Um, um, there will be a new awareness card uh, put into the package for patients to better inform them because we still see from from surveys um, um, we are doing with regard to knowledge in the general population about antimicrobial resistance that there are gaps that need to be addressed and this kind of awareness card uh, can also help in that respect. But also companies will, uh, will have to do the extra mile, they uh, will have to develop for antimicrobials uh, a so-called stewardship plan to, to better plan uh, the use, risk minimization measures regarding the use um, uh, in, in, in a structured and controlled way that can then also be discussed with the regulators. A another uh, important problem with regard to antimicrobials is uh, the absence really of novel antimicrobials. Um, uh, the, we have a rather dry pipeline in, in that regard, and that's partly related to um, um, a kind of broken business model because we, uh, from a public health perspective, we want uh, new antimicrobials, we want new classes of um, uh, products in this sphere, but at the same time, from a public health perspective, we do not want them to be widely used. Um, because uh, widespread uh, use of these new innovative antimicrobials would mean um, potentially, again, uh, rather quickly resistance to this new product. So a company developing, investing in antimicrobials will have the difficulty that the return of investment uh, will not come from the sales of, um, of the product itself um, because of this limited use. And that uh, has led uh, in the past to a situation where development programs were stopped, uh, um, companies not really interested in the field. Uh, we, we see a lot of SMEs in the field, but then they have um, problems with the financing of the development program. So what we are proposing here is, is a so-called um, transferable voucher, um, which um, basically gives the developer um, uh, a voucher for uh, a data protection period, that uh, an additional one year of data protection period that is not used for the antimicrobial itself because in a way, um, it would not create any value because of the, the low sales of that product, but which can be used for a product with higher sales to generate a return of investment for um, the development of the antimicrobial. And the company can decide to use it either for, for another product in, in, in its own portfolio or sell it to another company. And uh, in our view, and also from the impact assessment, this creates an, um, uh, uh, an interesting business case for the development of antimicrobials and may close this, this, this gap we currently have that um, companies and investors are not so interested in the field. Uh, obviously, that will mean that for a limited number of products, the products where the voucher will be used, um, uh, there is a delay in generic entry um, of that other product and uh, it will lead to additional costs uh, for uh, national health systems for this additional year of data protection of this more high selling uh, product. Uh, but if you compare the, uh, the costs of this additional year with the savings, if we have really new groundbreaking antimicrobials um, uh, available to us. Um, we think this is um, an investment which is uh, worth uh, taking the effort. And what is also important for us to stress 
first we limited the number of vouchers so it is not that um, there will be a lot in the system 10 vouchers are uh, foreseen as a maximum and uh, at the same time the conditions for this uh, new ground breaking antimicrobial are very high so it's really a product that um, would be key uh, to help us in the fight against antimicrobial resistance that will only benefit from from uh, the uh, from this incentive and the final point i want to mention i am in our analysis this this voucher system is also working well and complementary to to other incentives that exist for um, and for new antimicrobial developments also the commission also has this uh, health uh, emergency response authority which also looks at the uh, mechanism to support um, uh, antimicrobials and um, here we, we see a complementary between what we are proposing and uh, what uh, is discussed there so this is in a nutshell what we are proposing for for AMR. Um, I think I will stop my presentation here. Uh, I, I mean, if you have read um, or looked at what we are proposing, we are proposing a legislation with more than 400 articles. Uh, as said at the beginning in uh, a big review. So in a way, with our presentation, we we only. Uh, touched on the surface, if you then go into detail, there, there is much more to discover. Um, but if uh, you, you're interested uh, to follow up, uh, what I always say, what I recommend, read first um, the, the communication um, that the, com uh, the Commission published um, uh, together with the proposal, because it gives a good overview uh, of um of the of the proposal and the final point in time uh final point to make obviously this is this is now a commission proposal it is not yet the new new legislation so uh the, the next step uh, which will happen uh, from here as uh, you probably know is that now the the co-legislator the european parliament and the council will look will discuss um, this proposal and um, then uh, um, come uh, to common discussions, but also individual discussions, which will finally shape um, the new um, uh, legal framework for, um, for medicines in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Gloria, also for being so clear and concrete. And I give the floor then to Isabel Proaños. Uh, please, Isabel, let's try to be as concrete as possible so that we have we can take as many questions. Thank you very much. Indeed, I had a question also for, for the previous speaker, Mr. Salomon, and thank you also, Mr. Schmidt, for the presentation. So it's, my question is about something that has not been proposed uh, by the Commission, and is the complex medicinal products, drug device combinations. You have done a great effort in reviewing a lot of the legislation, but there is no proposal on this. While we know by a recent study by the FBI that uh, complex medicinal products account for at least 20% on average on the market authorizations from EMA in the last five years. And I'm asking these questions because the community I'm representing that are uh, chronic respiratory and allergy patients um, this is how the therapy is based on this. They're, they need to use these complex devices. But without um, clean, tidy up uh, legislation, because today is very fragmented and appears in, in different annexes, etc. And does it help for future proving and, and simplification? So these translate into what the patients see. Today, patients with chronic respiratory disease are uh, prescribed pills, as they are prescribed injectables, and they are prescribed inhalers. And they need training, they need support to, to get better results, adherence, concordance, personalized medicine. We're going to the digital dimension of medicinal products. So uh, my question is, why there is no proposal in this legislation? And if it's not in this legislation that 
this kind of uh, regulatory framework needs to fall, where would that be? And if there is any timeline to address this situation? Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Sandra. Yeah. yeah, thank you very much, Isabel, for the question. As Florian explained, it is, you know, a huge revision and we couldn't go to all the details, but I'm happy to tell you, you know, that uh, recognizing the issues that you have mentioned, uh, I mean, that this is a field, you know, where we see increasing innovation and very important for patients. We do have provisions in the legislation about, um, you know, what we call integral combination medicinal products and medical devices or medicinal products which are in the exclusive use with medical devices. Uh, this is actually, you know, you can find it in the directive. You know, so there are uh, about three articles, I think, what they explain. And just to explain a bit the, uh, the uh, philosophy, you know, of these provisions, it is uh, we do not change the medical devices legislation. What we are trying to create it is clarity, you know, how the two legal frameworks work so that, you know, we can streamline the authorization of those products, but also, you know, clarify the responsibility of the different players, you know, and especially the marketing authorization holder to um, and you know the exchange of information between the players in the in the uh, you know between uh, the marketing authorization and holder for the medicinal product but also the producer of the medical device so um, you know it's not a lengthy but you know the purpose of this it is to set the basis you know whether it's better interplay and implementation, if you would like, of the two legislations together to ensure, you know, um, you know, to address all these issues that you mentioned about this combination products. Thank you very much, Olga, for addressing it. Uh, so we have Klaus Meyer from the European Society of Oncology Pharmacy. Yes, thanks a lot uh, um, for the wonderful presentation as well to the uh, discussion. So I had uh, several points to the first session, but uh, I think uh, the time is short and I've sent a, a short chat uh, um, message to you. Probably you can include it as well. I have um, uh, said that uh, since uh, 12 years we are fighting as uh, oncology pharmacists against the shortages. We have had a, you know, one year, uh, no, five of you to, to serve 170,000 patients with colon carcinoma because of this one only drug and therefore, it makes a difference if we have an uh, uh, antibiotic shortage, what is uh, really sad uh, when we have a shortage with uh, oncology drugs because there is no uh, replacement uh, by uh, a, a different other uh, uh, drugs in the same uh, treatment level. So that means they're coming to one point only. Uh, finally, it's a discussion about the environmental discussion. So when we say since years that the production should be in Europe, when uh, uh, and if Emma will will take care for this uh, when they have an uh, admission admission uh, pro process to look at it, it it is produced in Europe or not. When you see the documents about pharma city in Hyderabad in India, where thousands of uh, uh, chemistries uh, are built, and this all goes to the to the water around this, and this goes to the ocean that comes uh, to the oceans to us. So when we are talking about MNR, MR, uh, AMR, so we have also to include these uh, conditions in that, not only to look how the intake of drugs is good or not. So I think we have to think much more global, much more wider, and this I would put this hands on this, and this can be managed as well when we, we stop this uh, environmental disaster through uh, including uh, the, the production in these areas where we have a hand on and not uh, only to, to comment this. Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, Florian, Olga? I, I think, I mean, I, I, I agree that uh, the environmental footprint also of manufacturing um, of, of medicinal products can be improved. Um, what we have to be mindful is also what can be achieved with with a legislation that is uh, focusing on the authorization of medicines. Um, uh, first, do we have the uh, the expertise in the system um, of um, medicines trained inspectors to uh, uh, monitor environmental standards both within um, the European Union and outside the European Union, where 
our um, basically analysis is that um, these trained inspectors for medicinal products are trained on the on the on the quality uh, side, but not necessarily on the environmental side, and therefore they may not be the best um, people to to ta uh, task with this job. Uh, the other problem we have is um, you spoke about facilities in in third countries, and there are certain legal limitations uh, with uh, what we can do with European legislation to enforce. Um, uh, standards, uh, environmental production standards outside uh, the European Union. Not uh, denying that, obviously, it's it's uh, it's an objective of the of the European Union to um, uh, um, promote good uh, environmental standards all over the world. Therefore, there are certain limitations what we can do. Uh, within uh, this legislation, but uh, I think um, it's it's a problem that also goes wider. We also have, for example, parallel discussions. Uh, can um, independent of the authorization of medicines, can member states, if they procure uh, uh, medicinal products, if they buy, uh, if they tender medicinal products, can they put into the tender of the uh, obligations? also uh, compliance with environmental standards. So also to, um, um, from that side, um, make clear that um, as a buyer of medicines, um, they want to see compliance with, 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 with certain issues. And that may also have an indirect impact on the decision of the company, whether they have production sites in Europe or outside the Europe. So in a way, what you are mentioning is, is part of, of a bigger discussion which um, uh, can, where we can make a bit of a positive impact with this legislation, but it needs much more action um, um, to, to really um, make um, positive. Um, impact. Just on the shortages part, because you raised also an important point, you know, just to say that, you know, and of course, you know, these are kind of critical medicines when you don't have alternatives. And, uh, you know, just to highlight that, you know, this proposal has a lot, it's kind of a toolbox approach, you know, for shortages, including this um, uh, defining the list of critical medicines. So basically, that action can go towards this direction that will limit the uh, negative effects that you mentioned, you know, when especially when you don't have alternatives for important therapies. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much. And uh, maybe we can take a question from Marcin uh, Rosinka from CPME. Thank you very much. I hope you can you can hear me. Um, first of all, congratulations on the on the enormous work. I think it's the it's the, it's a very good uh, proposal. And thanks for the for the webinar. I think it's great to have opportunities to ask. Questions. Um, I have uh, three very concrete questions. I will. I will shoot. Uh, so first, on the on the um, Article 48 in the regulation uh, that Florian you mentioned in your part of the presentation on the repurposing of medicines based on data provided by the not-for-profit. Um, I would like to clarify whether the the marketing authorization holder will benefit uh, from the um, regulatory protection because there's a, there's an exception I think in the article. But it doesn't apply to the uh, to the uh, to the protection based on this uh, kind of source of data, considering that data is coming from the um, not for profit. So that's one one for clarification. Um, second is on the whether you you considered in the in the work uh, need for oversight um, when it comes to the um, uh, educational materials, stewardship plans, and awareness cards on the use of antimicrobials. Mm -hmm for the time being they are uh, designed to be provided by the companies um, and 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 uh, so that's that's a question whether that was really thought through and whether that is the best way to uh, to approach and the last uh, thing about the um, supply obligation vis-a-vis um, -vis the use of the voucher so it's one of the conditions for the voucher but from reading the proposal, um, it was not clear to me whether this uh, obligation for supply is uh, sustainable and uh, whether the company is really obliged to commit long term to the supply of the antimicrobial to the market. So if you could expand a little bit on that, how this can be ensured that this is lasting really. Um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. 
Florian, okay. Yeah, thank you. And um, I mean, this is now really a deep dive into into the uh, nitty gritty of the of the legislation with regard to Article Forty Eight. Uh, I mean, the idea of 48 is basically to um, um, come to an opinion by the regulators that is then used by every marketing organization holder that um, is concerned that has a product with this active substance and for which the data applies. So um, by um, uh, coming from this logic, obviously there is no sense in protecting that data because um, you want that uh, that data becomes uh, or is coming on label for all the products concerned. So there shouldn't be any restriction with uh, data protection. Still, independent of Article 48, we, we, we still allow for the possibility that um, independent of this process, uh, companies um, um, connect with non-profit organizations, with academia, to um, basically start the process by themselves. And if they start the process by themselves and put the uh, respective uh, variation with that data into the system, then they may uh, still benefit. Uh, from uh, uh, data protection. So it, uh, it depends a bit uh, who is the initiator. With regard to the uh, uh, education and material and awareness card um, you raised, the provisions in the legislations are uh, high level, I would say. They, they introduce the, the concept, they introduce um, the, the principle, but they are not very detailed uh, with regard to, to process uh, and so on and so forth. But importantly, even if the initial design is coming from um, the, the company itself, they have to be um, checked by the regulators. And then over time, uh, um, what we also expect is the development of guidelines around these um, products. And for this development of guidelines, um, we, um, as always, uh, if it's guidelines from the European Medicines Agency, you will see a lot of possibilities for everybody concerned to come in with their point of view and with, with their expertise to, to shape these guidelines. So you have to often read into addition to what is described in the legislation itself. Uh, the fact that to operationalize these provisions, there may be the need for additional complementary steps that don't need to be uh, uh, provided in legislation, but that will happen um, uh, um, uh, anyway, as we did in the past. And then the final question with regard to the supply of uh, antimicrobials, um, there, there is a bit um, um, also a, a legal issue to, to consider uh, at a certain point, we, we have to um, make sure that there is a legal clarity on whether there is a voucher or uh, there is no voucher. So we, we cannot keep the, the possibility open endlessly that the, the voucher may uh, be revoked or cannot be used. And so once this time is passed, obviously the conditions that lead uh, to the voucher are, more, um, are no longer directly enforceable through the voucher system because the company has already used uh, the voucher. But then for supply uh, related questions, why with the requirements we, we are requesting the company, we, we already think they have to invest in ensuring the supply, so um, we also have difficulties to understand why they would then suddenly disinvest. And um, the, the other issue is um, that other more general provisions uh, regarding continuous supply of medicines will then kick in um, uh, that we have for all medicines or then potentially for more um, uh, diligent for critical medicines that um, will uh, ensure uh, continued supply also after the voucher is no longer a tool uh, to enforce um, this, this requirements. Excellent, thank you very much. I think I'm aware of the time and I think we should respect it. Uh, 
Unfortunately, there are a lot of questions. I think this is a testimony of the, of the interest, but uh, maybe we cannot take more at this time. So um, thank you for all the interest. And uh, I think it's clear. And um, we, will, we will publish this on the website. And also we are, we are taking all the questions in the chat and we will put them together. We will share with Olga and Florian also for us, it's really relevant. And this will be taken into account in future presentations, in future discussions and in general terms. Some of these are not questions and are comments, so it will be duly considered. And if you want to write anything else, we will still uh, take it. It is still uh, open. Um, <clears throat> I mean, uh, I mean, we, we have seen, and, and, and it's true that this is just, as, as Florian Auga said, is the beginning of the legislative process. So uh, there are a lot of questions, but I think it's very good to see that in this proposal, many of the issues which have been raised for many, for many years before by patients and healthcare professionals are incorporating. So it, it, it's clear that your, your, your concerns, your comments are fully taken into account. And uh, today's webinar is, a, is as another proof that we will continue this dialogue as the legislative process continues. We will use the patients and consumers working party, the healthcare professional working party, but we will also continue involving the eligible organizations as well as academics. And I would like to thank a lot again, Olga and Florian for your time and for your openness, the way that you have uh, discussed all the issues in such uh, an open manner. So thanks a lot. We will continue working all together and uh, as you say, it's the beginning of the process and we'll keep everyone updated. Thank you very much and, and a big thanks as well to Maria and Rumi who have supported the organization and I don't know Olga and Florian if you want to say a final word. Yeah, I mean, from my side, also, you know, huge thanks to the agency college for organizing the webinar and to all, um, uh, you know, the people involved, you know, and uh, having so many questions, you know, I'm reading while we're going through. And as you said, Juan, we'll read with a lot of, you know, interest, the questions and the, um, the comments. Thank you very much to everyone. Bye. Thanks again. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone.